I'm really good today. How are you? I didn't even ask the question yet. I just knew what you were going to ask. What the H-E double hockey sticks? Oh, come on. We can't say hell. and welcome back to The Real Deal, Ball State's premier entertainment news show. I'm your host, Josh Pavlovsky. And I'm Colin Marth. Now, uh, Josh, you're having some trouble with the prompter today, right? Parenthetical, Josh. Parenthetical? No, I'm not. What the flip? Well, uh, totally seems like you are, dude. Josh, parenthetical, Josh. What are you talking about, dude? Okay, dude, you don't have to read your name every time. It's just there to prompt you. Why is it on there if I'm not supposed to read it? It's just, just to cue you. Dude, like, we've gone over this 10 times already. Why are you not getting it? Well, you can take your cue and shove it up here. Uh, anyways, first segment, let's go. Every once in a while, I get a random itch to binge a film series that I have not seen yet. My latest victim over the summer was the famous Scream franchise. Scream is a film series that renowned filmmaker Wes Craven created. Scream films are often labeled as scary movies, however, I wouldn't label them as such. This slasher series does have its fair share of intense moments, but I think the best thing about this series is its meta-commentary on the horror genre. The first film came out at a time when slashers were done to death. Friday the 13th, Halloween, A Nightmare on Elm Street, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and so many other examples. So when Wes Craven crafted this slasher that did acknowledge the cliches and had fun with them, it felt refreshing. When word gets out that a killer in a ghost outfit is on the loose, most of the characters begin to look at the situation as if they were in a horror film. There is even a scene at a party when a guy tells everyone how to successfully survive a horror movie. The commentary does not come off as if Scream is hating on the cliches of films like it. It comes off in a loving way. The films that follow the sc first Scream go above commenting on horror films and poke fun at cliches of sequels. At times, a c character begin predicting who among their friends will die through analyzing the character deaths of sequel films. In the films themselves, a franchise titled Stab is created that is based on the character Ghostface Murders. This makes fun of the fact that some horror films are loosely based on true events and begin to get exploited for money. The latest example of this occurrence is The Conjuring franchise. The latest film in the Scream franchise titled Scream makes fun of reboot sequels. The title itself is even making fun of reboot sequels. A few years ago, the Halloween franchise had the reboot sequel treatment, and the first film in this new series of films was titled Halloween, even though this is like the millionth Halloween film. So Scream 5 being called Scream is a nice little nod to that. The film even brings up how horror has changed recently with elevated horror films like Hereditary, The Babadook, and The Lighthouse. The way this franchise manages to poke fun at the horror genre and the film industry as a whole is really smart and genuinely makes for a fun watch. If you have been considering watching the Scream movies this upcoming Halloween season, I would highly encourage you to. On top of some clever writing and playful jabs at the industry, they have some moments that will definitely make you jump and yell at your TV because a character won't turn around because Ghostface is right behind them! Another fun layer of the films is the mystery behind who is Ghostface. It changes every film and it's always fun guessing throughout the film who it is. I watched all these films alone, but I would highly recommend you watch them with a good group of friends. I think these films would be way more fun with friends to joke around with. If you want a place to stream the franchise, the first three films are on, are on Showtime. Meanwhile, the fourth and fifth films are on Paramount+. Plus. The sixth film just wrapped filming and is set to release in theaters March 2023. That's all I have to say. Hope you're doing well. Have a great day. Well, anyways, uh, how, how are, are you? you? Dude, that was, uh, that's my line. You get all the lines, and you were supposed to ask that at the beginning, Nini? <sighs> if you knew how to read the prompter properly, maybe you'd get more lines, dumbass. What, what, what the heck is a dumbass? It's a bass that goes dumb. 
Oh, now, now you get your lines right. No, no, they're censoring me now. Well, hopefully the writers don't censor this next segment. Hey guys, Kiana here, and back for another great season here at The Real Deal. For today, I thought we would take a little deep into what is going on in the world of pop culture news. So I'm really excited to bring you a new segment to the show that I like to call Kiana's Culture Crave. Basically, where I find and break down some of pop culture's juiciest stories that people are constantly craving. Whether it's all about the Don't Don't Worry Darling drama of Harry Styles and Olivia Wilde, or just getting invisibly slapped in the face by something so talked about you would want to crave. And I'm not just talking about Will Smith. I find the stories you crave and deliver them with a dash of humor and insight. So let's get to it. First culture craving is none other than the passing of Her Majesty the Queen. Queen Elizabeth II passed away on Thursday at the age of 96. She leaves behind an incredible legacy of leading Britain for a remarkable 70 years on the throne from 1952 until her passing. Also, she was the longest running British monarch in history, the longest running female head of state in history, and the second longest reigning sovereign in world history. She was synonymous to pop culture. She was on coins, dollars, t-shirts, even did her own sketch with Paddington Bear for her Platinum Jubilee celebration three months ago. Hey, bust out the marmalade sandwiches. This was one of the reasons why I liked the queen. She had a witty sense of humor, even for a world leader like her. After watching that clip, made me want to marmalade sandwiches, and who knows, I'll have to keep them in my purse from now on. When I first heard the news of her passing, I was just waiting for somebody to press the psych button. And no, I'm not talking about the TV show. The Queen, the queen is like Britain's national treasure, just like Betty White was America's golden girl. Even though they are so different, that's what it felt like when I heard the news. We've all been there. When somebody who you've heard of in the news, a celebrity, anybody that has been in the spotlight, it feels like the world is ending. Really, but not really. <laughs> or am I? <laughs> Anyways, she was literally Britain's national treasure. And I'm not just saying that because she had a royal vault of jewelry that I wish I could get my hands on. Like they say, diamonds are really a girl's best friend. But life as a college student, the struggle is real. A girl can hope and dream. But she was a prominent figure to Britain and to the world. Britain has entered a 10-day period of mourning until her funeral on Monday, September 19th. Her son now proclaimed, King Charles III is now the new monarch of Britain, alongside his wife, Queen Consort Camilla, which makes his son, Prince William, heir to the throne. My heart's thoughts and prayers are with the whole country of Britain and with the royal family. And to the Queen, in the words of Paddington Bear, thank you, ma'am, for everything you've done. Your grace and your humor and the way you led your country will never be forgotten. May you rest in peace and God save the queen. And I know, I know, it's God save the king now, but don't care. Sorry, not sorry. Well, before I get all in my feelings, our last culture craving will be all about Monday night's 74th annual Emmy Awards. One of the awards I hope to win someday for outstanding choreography, just like one of my top five celebrity crushes, Derek Huff, who happens to be a three-time Emmy winner himself. But enough about my celebrity crushes. Monday Night Show was, big, was a big night for all the best in TV. From Kenan Thompson hosting, from Christopher Maloney and Mariska Hargitay almost kissing. Be still my Bensler heart. I love Barbara, but he ain't got nothing on Detective Stabler. From Jennifer Coolidge dancing her way to an Emmy win for Best Supporting Actress in a Limited Series or Movie for The White Lotus, to, Zen to Zendaya slaying, as always, and as she should, winning her second Emmy Award for Lead Actress in a Drama Series for Euphoria, making her the youngest two-time Emmy winner and the first black woman to win a Lead Actress two consecutive times. From Quinta Bronson winning her Emmy for Outstanding Writing for one of the year's breakout shows, and one of my personal favorites this year, Abbott Elementary. Also, if you watch Monday Night Show, when she won, I was just like Jimmy Kimmel, on the floor, dead. Ugh. Also, Cheryl Lee Ralph also nabbing a win for Best Supporting Actress in a Comedy Series for Abbott Elementary. She was the first black woman to win in that category since Jack A. Harry, who took on the Emmy 35 years ago in 1987. Also, Lizzo representing the big girls as she took home her first Emmy for Outstanding Competition Series. Halfway there to EGOT status, BTW, by the way. And side note, her speech was one of the best speeches of the night, talking all about how she wanted people to see her for who she really is. That really got to me. Me being a plus girl, I was like, girl, you better talk and preach. And some other big winners from Ozark to the White Lotus, 
from Squid Game to Ted Lasso, winning for Best Comedy Series for the second year in a row, and leading man Jason Sudeikis taking home the trophy for lead actor in a comedy series for the second year in a row also. Personally, Abbott Elementary was my pick, but I'm not better. Just like the one and only Michael Keaton took home his first Emmy for Best Supporting Actor in a limited series for his work in Dope Sick. Now, my money was on Sebastian Stan for portraying Tommy Lee in the limited Hulu series Pam and Tommy. And I'm biased because he killed it. It would have made my shipper heart so happy and proud to see him get the recognition he deserves for other projects. I would have been screaming for miles with excitement if he won. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm so happy for Michael Keaton. He will always be my favorite Batman. I'm just impartial to Sebastian Stan because it's Sebastian freaking Stan. Hello, people. Bucky Barnes. He will always have my heart. And he's also on my, he's also on my top crush list. And here I go again with the crushing. I need help. Like I said, not bitter. But Ted Lasso wasn't the only night's big winner. Succession taking home the, the night's top prize for outstanding drama series and two other trophies. By the way, I would definitely recommend Succession, Abbott Elementary, and Ted Lasso. All amazing shows. I don't even have to mention Euphoria just because y'all already know. It's Euphoria. But just don't let Chrissy, who is a Euphoria one-on-one -on -one super fan herself, hear you say you've never watched it or, or else. Well, that's all there was on the menu for today. Thank you guys so much for listening. See you guys next week for another play of Kiana's Culture Crave. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Ring a bell, anybody? Why is the 17th Amendment in the script? Oh, dear. What? You're so critical today. <sighs> Do you not know the First Amendment? It's like the first one. Why should I care? Aren't the people who wrote it super old anyways? Uh, they're probably dead. No, they're dead? You can't be serial. Jeez. All right, well, uh, we're gonna go to this next segment while I explain this to my co-host. Hey everybody, my name is Terry Clayton, but you can call me TC or TC Productions. Today, I'll be talking about my favorite form of media. Whew. I've been doing media for about four years now. It all started when I was in high school. I was a reporter for a school show called Tech TV. I did broadcast media from a wide range of topics, covering sports, news, and entertainment. In today's era, the media is the way we get our information. I mean, you can literally open your phone right now and find out all the events that are happening this week. No diss to newspapers, but how many students really pick up a newspaper? Not that much. And if you're confused, wondering, isn't print media the same as broadcast media? Then let me explain real quick. They're in the same category as media, but they're just two different type of forms. Print news involves paper or a computer. Broadcast news involves people, either a TV show or a radio station. Broadcast news is informing the audience with everyday news like this, or talking on a radio station, giving reviews to songs, or having artists or people come talk on the show. Broadcast media is what, what I sell at the most. So again, broadcast media, it may sound biased, but it's way better than print news. There are a lot of jobs that go into broadcasting. Like for starters, you can learn how to write, edit, produce, or even direct. Most jobs look for people who usually have a degree in this type of field, whether it's radio and television, journalism, or broadcast engineering. When I first touched the camera, I fell in love with it. There's so much you can do with broadcast media using different software such as Adobe Premiere, Final Cut Pro, or, e or even using an app called iMovie on an iPhone. Picking up a camera did so many wonderful things for me, like taking me places I never thought I would go. And still to this day, I take my camera with me everywhere I go. I remember when I showed my friends my camera. They said, what you gonna call yourself? And they said, hmm, TC Productions. Then one day at school I had the camera on and somebody said, hey, it's a shoot. So that's how I came up with the name and slogan for my brand. TC Productions, it's a shoot. Well, that's a wrap for my segment today on my favorite form of media. I'm Terry, but again, you can call me TC or TC Productions, and I'll see you guys on another show of The Real Deal. Why would you do this to me? Dude, calm down. What the effing flip do you want from me? Don't censor me again, I swear to God. I just can't believe they're really dead. Well, too bad, so sad, nan nan and boo boo. No, there's no way the writers actually put that in. Like, you're crapping me. Wait, wait, can, can I not say crap? I'm not 
I'm not trying to say crap. I want to say the S word. God, oh. I'm crying. Okay, fine. We'll deal with being censored next week. I'm sorry. It's time for the final words. I'll go first. You compose yourself. And on with the final words, I guess. Hello, my name is Kyle Marth. Uh, a lot of you guys don't know me, uh, but I'm going to talk to you about my favorite movie ever. It's called The Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou. It was released in 2004. It's a Wes Anderson movie. It stars Bill Murray, Willem Dafoe, uh, Owen Wilson is in it, uh, Angelica Houston is in it, uh, Kate Blanchett is also in it. It's a very, very good movie. It is one of his most underrated movies, and I think it is the greatest thing ever. Uh, it makes me laugh every time. It made me cry. I'm just kidding. No, it didn't. But uh, it's a really good movie, very funny, uh, and I think you guys should go watch it. And if you ever want to watch it on Blu-ray, I have a copy. Um, I'm not going to give it to you, but uh, I also have the soundtrack on vinyl, and the reason I have the soundtrack on vinyl is because it's my favorite movie, and I think it's really good. And also a lot of the songs are David Bowie songs that are sung in Portuguese acoustically. Uh, so if that interests you, which it probably doesn't when you first hear it, uh, contact me uh, at Colin Marth anywhere online. Uh, anyways, that's it guys. That's my little ramble thing. I love you. I spent my weekend watching Riverdale. Yes, Riverdale. Now, I know what everyone is thinking, why? Well, if you go into it looking at it like a cartoon show or Glee or the multiverse where any absurd thing can happen, it's so entertaining. Like there are so many storylines going on, whether it be murder, mystery, aliens, ghosts, magic, mayhem, or alternate realities. Although it is very fast paced, it's one of my favorite watches as of recent. Truly a guilty pleasure. I advise everyone to give it a second chance. It's perfect for the fast and short attention span form of media that we are in currently. However, I do recommend skipping the musical episodes. Give it a shot, maybe you'll love it. And remember, anything can happen in Riverdale. As always, thank you for watching. If you want to see anything else from us here at The Real Deal, be sure to check us out on all of our socials, including Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and our website for all things entertainment. I'm Josh Pavlovsky. And I'm Colin Morris. Thank you so much for watching.